Australia's economic breakdown crisis requires action, not words. And Ukraine's standoff pushes world to brink of another nuclear missile crisis. Coming up on this week's Citizens Report. Welcome to the Citizens Report. It's the 14th of January, 2022. I'm Robert Barwick. I'm joined today by Citizens Party founder and leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. So in this week's Citizens Report, we're going to talk about what's happening in our economy at the moment as a result of the, well, triggered mm -hmm. uh, by the, the COVID pandemic, but, the, but why it's the long-term consequences of what we've done for ourselves too long and why Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce needs to be held to account for building the Bradfield Scheme. And secondly, um, the world got very dangerous over the Christmas break, Craig. Uh, there's, there's a second flashpoint. I mean, it's been building, it's been there for all along, but it's got very intense in Ukraine, right? And we need to give the other side of that from what the people are getting on the mainstream media. Yeah, it's something that we've been talking about for years, Robbie, because it has never been solved. No, exactly. Before we begin, though, Craig, uh, just a couple of updates for regular viewers from uh, issues that we were highlighting last year. Um, uh, people would know that we required or requested everyone make submissions to the Regional Banking Task Force, which were due by the 18th of December. Well, um, we, I know we've got a lot of submissions in there calling for a postal bank. The Regional Banking Task Force consultation meetings are underway. There was one in Mildura the day before yesterday. Um, the, the politicians who attended that reported that the big concern was, surprise, surprise, the availability of cash. Yeah. Right, and of course that relates to the the cash ban campaign that we've been um, we fought and 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 beat the government's cash ban law to ban transactions over ten thousand dollars, but the private banks are still pushing for the removal of cash. Right, mm -hmm. so the the the, the, pol the politicians got the clear message: we need cash to remain available. Well, we can do that with a postal bank. Right, that can it, it doesn't have a profit motive to get rid of cash like the private banks do. Um, so that's that. The second one I've got to highlight is. Um, we're, we're, on, we're in the middle of this inquiry for, about the Sterling First collapse, right? Where there's 140 mostly elderly, um, mostly West Australian elderly people who all face eviction onto the streets because they were victims of a scheme that ASIC knew about mm -hmm. and did nothing to warn them, right? The regulator knew about and did nothing to warn them. So the update on that is um, just before Christmas, the, regular, the, the chairman of the regulator, ASIC, Joe Longo, flew to Western Australia to meet with the victims. And when they had the meeting, even though he was present in Western Australia, he was still on a screen. They could only meet him on the screen. And the whole thing was a schmozzle. All the victims were interested in was him turning up with a cheque mm -hmm. to compensate them for ASIC's failure to inform them that they were walking into a trap, when ASIC knew they were, essentially. Um, Anyway, the, the, the part I can report is that um, Longo was making excuses the whole time. And one of his excuses was um, to, to point out that ASIC gets 10,000 complaints a year, right? And that, that, of course, is why his excuse, they, they can't look at all these particular examples and police everything. And, and uh, one of the victims said, you'd get zero complaints if you did your job. <laughs> and as, uh, Longo just glared at that. Anyway, that's a shim that's ASIC's attitude is disgusting. They're just there to cover their butts in terms of this process, not to actually help uncover why why it went so bad. Um, we will continue to report that and, and fight on that issue because it's not just about the victims. Those victims need compensation, but ASIC and the whole regulatory structure in Australia needs to be overhauled. That's why we're on that job. Um, and then that does relate to what we're about to talk about. So our first our first issue today. Australia's economic breakdown requires actions, not words. And this has suddenly become really, really serious. The sh shelves in supermarkets are empty, right? Now, what do you blame? That Technically, the blame is the pandemic and the isolation rules, etc. cetera. Um, but this, what... The point that we want to make, Craig, is this is all the chickens coming home to roost yeah, all look, at once. Yeah, Robbie, we've been, uh, it's 20 years ago, we put out a report, you know, facing, it, facing the depression of police, a fascist police state or economic development in this report here. Now, this goes through what actually has 
to be done to avoid what we've seen in the police state with all these fascist laws coming in, but also what has to be done to, to, to de economically make the develop... Make economy work. Economic develop our, com uh, our country, you know, make the economy work, as you say. So what we did was map out large-scale infrastructure development projects that could be done straight away. And they still could be done straight away because that's the key here to rebuilding the economy. Well, in a minute, I want you to go through some of the things that we put out in that report because um, we're, we're winning an argument. However, that's why I said it's got to be actions, not words. But let's just recap where we're at right now, right? We are... Too, everyone, these are things people can see right now. We are way too dependent on offshore manufacturing. And so that relates to our supply chain. People are saying, oh, the supply chain's in trouble. Why do we have such long supply chains internationally and domestically, right? We, we dismantled our manufacturing in Australia. Um, we can't even manufacture basic medicines that we need. Well, it's more right? than that, Robbie. There seems to be a general incompetence on this in this area where, oh, no, we'll be right, we'll supply, we'll, we'll get the supply at the last minute. Just in time. Take a look at the rapid antigen tests. And what really shocked me is that we do have an Australian manufacturer of those rapid antigen tests that went to the government back in August last year and says, how many of things, these things do you think we need, would you like? And guess what? They said, no, we don't need any, thanks very much, we're right. And that's, that manufacturer now supplies all those rapid antigen tests to the United States under contract. So what people are experiencing, again is this incompetence that you see when people don't look at actually how the physical economy yep. functions. That you can't just rely on last minute inventories to solve problems. And related to that, Craig, the Transport Workers Union this week revealed its correspondence with Scott Morrison personally from September, October, where they were saying, you're gonna need rapid antigen tests, what are you doing about and it? And he's saying, no, we're not gonna need it. Australian them. Medical Association, the same thing. Again, we're right. We're not. Don't have to worry about this. Yeah. And the problem is, is, even with now the recommendation for people to wear N95 or KN95 masks, they're not manufactured in this country. The P2 masks, which are the same thing, there's a few of them manufactured here, but in terms of the scale that we need these things, yeah. again, we're suffering because our government has this attitude, oh no, comparative advantage. This is the yeah. philosophy of the government we have at the present time. Our comparative advantage is, in effect, mining up, digging up minerals out of the ground, therefore we should concentrate on that and we get rid of everything else, including manufacturing. We can rely on someone else around the world to manufacture what we Except need. Except when we get into a problem uh, and there's a supply chain problem. So, so that's the thing. We can criti And they do, should be criticised. Morrison's uh, you know, ignorance on rapid antigen tests could be criticised. That's a short-term question. The mentality, though, of comparative advantage um, just in time, the whole idea that supply chain should be structured just in time, right? There's no... There's no um, leeway if something goes wrong, and all the, these are all the things that are breaking down right now. Robbie, we've been talking about this for over 30 years. Yep. The CEC, the Citizens Electoral Council, you know, for our, the previous name of our organisation, now the Australian Citizens Party, we've been documenting, printing, publishing. This is an example of this here in this yep. magazine, in this uh, New Citizen. The point is that this is known. Exactly. It's an ideological debate around this concept of free trade and effectively putting, you know, it does boil back down to the fact that you've got a financial system that dictates the economy instead of a government, a political class that dictates how the economy will run and regulate the government and, let's and talk, regulate the banks. So let's talk about a, the financial side of it because one of the things that's happening now which really is going to be the biggest chicken coming home to roost is inflation. Yeah. Now inflation has two causes. There's been a flood of money since 2008 into the financial system worldwide in the form of quantitative easing. It has to show up in inflation eventually. It's already, it's already, it has shown up as inflation in asset prices like houses, right? The other cause is the breakdown crisis, the, the supply chain crisis, because then everyone's desperate to get what's there and they're willing to pay premium and suddenly the expenses go through the roof, right? Um, now, what happens with inflation, Craig, is we have a reserve bank whose job it is to control inflation. They have one trick, raise interest rates. And when that happens, now the Federal Reserve overnight, foreshad the US Federal Reserve foreshadowed four interest rate rises this year. New Zealand did two before Christmas. Australia's reserve bank's trying to hold the, 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 back the tide, but guess what? It's gonna be impossible. Because, but why are they trying to hold back the tide? Because they know there's so much debt out there being borne by households mm. that cannot, they can't handle the debt at this record lower level of interest rate. 
right? If interest rates go up, then you're going to have a, a smashing of those households, a smashing of the, of the property bubble, which is the other trick in our economy besides mining. It's the, it's the housing market, right? And if that smashes, the whole system is at risk, right? Mm -hmm. Starting with the banks. So that's where we're at right now. And you think, man, you know, um, how's it come to this? I want to point out, some people would be thinking, oh, everything would be fine if it wasn't for the pandemic. No, and that's why you've got to understand that the, the long-term thinking that led to this. That's not true. We've warned about this, Robbie, for years. Exactly. The, the exact formulations were that you cannot take down your manufacturing industry and expect the, the economy to survive. Yep. We've done that over the last 30 to 40 years. We've been now at the beck and call of you know, having to import everything, and that's what we're at. And the other thing we did in, in warning about this, we also exposed the ideological source of this. Yes. We call it ideological. This is not incompetence. This has been ideological yeah, sabotage. And and just to recap quickly, there was a, a British think tank called the Mont Pelerin Society, which after World War II set out to revive 19th century British liberalism, right, which was the economic theories of the East India Company, right, uh, the world's biggest ever monopoly that was able to loot and plunder the whole world, right, any country that it wanted to. And they had all these economists like John Adams, J Thomas Malthus, David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, these are the great economists of, of British liberalism, and, and um, they were on the payroll of the East India Company. So the Mont Pelerin Society set out to revive that because at the time of the Mont Pelerin Society was started, you had Australia under Curtin and Chifley, you had America defined by the politics of, of, and economics of Franklin Roosevelt, and the world, you, the British had na just nationalised the Bank of England, the world had abandoned those policies towards one of public investment, right, and actually making the economy work. And that was the 20 years after World War II, Craig, was the period of the greatest economic productivity in the history of the world, those 20 years. And the Mont Pelerin Society wanted to bring back the liberalism policies to smash that. And in Australia, they had think tanks like the Centre for Independent Studies and the Institute of Public Affairs and the Tasman Institute, and they gave us free trade, deregulation, privatisation, union busting, all this kind of stuff. That's what took over in the 80s and the 90s, right? And they smashed manufacturing, they smashed our productive economy, and they gave us what we have now. We have a, our largest sector now is financial services. So we're a casino, we're a housing bubble, and we're a, we're a quarry for mining. Mm. That's what they turned us into, mm. right? Um, and consequently, the, one of the arguments, and we covered this in this week's alert service, Craig, but one of the arguments was to, to, the small government argument, right? Government's incompetent. Government should get out of the economy. That's what they said. Government should have no role in the economy. The consequence of that, Craig, is that at the moment, when the government is making these decisions to do with the pandemic, you can see they have no competence in the economy. They don't actually build. Scott Morrison somehow thinks that the private sector is so magical that it will efficiently and magically adjust to any, any crisis. And of course it doesn't, no. right? It absolutely doesn't do that. And they don't have any economic understanding in government. And it wasn't always that way. So what we talked about in our alert service this week, um, in the, the lead, what's Barnaby doing about the Bradfield scheme, which we'll get to in a minute, is at the end of World War II, how, what, what was Australia's economic outlook? We had Curtin and Chifley. We, we were an economy that had just been transformed by the war, right? We had used the war to become a manufacturing powerhouse. We were committed to keeping that. Ch Chifley got the Commonwealth Bank to invest money in starting the car industry. And that industry just grew and grew until at one point there were seven manufacturers in Australia. Australia's little market supported seven manufacturers. We, we could manufacture anything. We had um, uh, th things like the space industry, right? We were, we were pioneers in space. We were spot pioneers in, in, in um, computer technology. We built the Snowy Mountain Scheme. And people got to appreciate how big the deal that was, right? In 1948, when we committed to the Snowy Mountain Scheme, Craig, Australia had a record federal debt, 140% of GDP. Today, people talk about, are worried about our debt, it's 30% of GDP. Back then it was 140%. Yet we embarked on a scheme that was 15% of GDP and cost, which today would be the equivalent of $300 billion. And we're gonna play a clip a little while later, you'll see Peter Credlin refer to a price tag for the Bradfield scheme. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but just, just contrast that to the Snowy. 
It would be the equivalent of a $300 billion scheme today at a time of record foreign debt we did that. Yet we built one of the engineering marvels of the world in that scheme, See, right? That's what we could do in those days. Yeah, very important aspects of the, what, what Curtin Shipley did, Robbie, because they, first of all, they, through regulation, they controlled the private banks through the Commonwealth Bank. Yep. There was a national bank that could admit credit into the economy. In fact, that's how we funded the war. The Commonwealth Bank stood as the bulwark in order to fund the policies of Curtin and Shifley. Yes, we went into a lot of debt, but where did that debt go? It yes. went into building real assets. The debt was for And the thing stuff. about the Bradfield scheme, as we'll talk about in a minute, or even the Sydney Harbour Bridge, it cost a lot of money to build that bridge. Is it still here today? Yep. Is it still carrying traffic? Yes. It hasn't gone away. And the thing about infrastructure... They built the future is what they built. You're building into the future. You're getting long assets that will last 100 years. So therefore, the cost of that asset can't be treated like you would in a normal private company's boardroom where you're after the, the, the return on the inf infrastructure as a profit into the, into the profits and the running of the company. You're talking about developing the economy such that you have infrastructure that commits to expanding the physical economic output of the economy as a whole. So let me read... Big, big, big difference between the way that this government looks at infrastructure and so forth as opposed to we do. Well, they look at infrastructure as a way for Macquarie Bank investors to make money. <laughs> Let me read 1941, October 1, 1941, Dr. J.J.C. Bradfield, who built the Sydney Harbour Bridge and designed the Bradfield scheme, he wrote this in Ridges magazine. I'm just going to read you one paragraph. But this was, he, he wrote this thing called Wither Away Australia, and the first wither was spelt W-H-I-T-H-E-R, and the second paragraph, which I won't read, um, is spelt W-I-T-H-E-R. Oh, that was the contrast if we do nothing. But I want to just give it the positive. What, would hap what we could do in this country. He said, wither away Australia, question mark, by a bold progressive policy of national development, rejuvenate our arid lands, provide hydroelectric power for industrial purposes, uh, open up our vast territories by highways, aviation ways and railways, manufacture our primary products into goods we require, Populate, develop and defend Australia. Be a free and vigorous people, keeping our place in the sun by our individualism. That's what Dr Bradfield laid out was our perspective. And in fact, he thought we would have 40 million people in Australia by 1990 when he mm. wrote that back in 1941 um, because he's, you know, he's, he saw Australia's potential was immense. So, Craig, that's what we've tried to fight for, the whole history of the Citizens Party. And uh, what, in 2002... We put out this report. That's 20 um, years ago. Yeah. 20, okay, there's 20. I hadn't thought about that. This is the 20th anniversary of one of the best things the Citizens Party ever put out. Um, and we won't go through it in great depth, but this is available. People can, can um, contact us to get a copy, either physically or electronically. But let's just go. We laid out what could be done. Just, a, just a, some detailed examples of what could be done for Australia, Craig, starting with great water projects. Yeah, we, had, we actually published a huge map in the front of it, in, in the centre of it, Robbie, you know, which goes through all the different 18 water projects that we could have in this country. That and one of them is the Bradfield, which we'll talk about. And then you've got the Clarence River scheme as well, which ironically is also in Barnaby Joyce's yeah, electorate, well, that's right? that's right. So then we talked about, you know, we go through in great detail the water projects. Then we talked about solving a salinity problem, yep. right? Because we still have a big salinity problem in this country, given that... It was very big at the time we wrote that. We talked about how Australia must go a nuclear, nuclear. Yep. right? Building actually modular high-temperature gas-cooled reactors. Now Emissions-free nuclear, by the way. That's right. And we should be participating in the fusion uh, economy these days as well. We talked about large rail, you know, large railway schemes like the... Uh, the the uh, Australian ring rail proposal of Professor Lance Endersby of ring rail, putting a ring rail all around Australia. The Melbourne to Darwin fast freight line. Um, and then, of course, on the other side, maglev high-speed passenger rail. But not just a rail line, Robbie. Building development corridors, corridors yep. where you actually have a, uh, an idea of building new cities, you know, pipelines, water pipelines, whatever you need in order to be able to populate those areas of our country that are, that are barren yep. at the present time. We actually also talked about the need for high-speed shipping. We were a leader and still are a leader in some places in high-speed shipping. We could actually have a high-speed speed shipping industry. But as industry. an integrated concept where, oh, just, just quickly, high-speed rail from Lance Energy's idea is high-speed rail that from, could get from Melbourne to Darwin in 24 hours, connect to high-speed shipping and, and reach the biggest markets in the world within a handful of days where fresh goods from Victoria mm. 
and all along the route could be feeding people in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in Singapore and in China within three or four days. Now, Robbie, that, that doesn't come with a cheap price tag. But again, no. this is an asset that will last for decades, you know, 50, 100 years. And look at the economic development and expansion that you could have right along the whole corridor. So whatever you spend in the physical payment of this is expanding the economy from the development itself, but also the increase in the economic output that you actually create. So, I mean, just quickly, we also you know talk about the need to develop a space industry in this country. We were, we were and, big space pioneers and, and we lost it all. We talk about how to rebuild the health system back then because, you know, this was in 2002. It was in 1997 that we saw the takedown of the healthcare system yep. under Jeff Kennett, under these Montpelier and Society reports. I mean, they just absolutely devastated the public health system here in Victoria. And that's why coming into the pandemic, we were completely unprepared for anything because everything was decentralised, sorry, sorry, centralised, and everything was shut down. We had and, next to no staff. And a mentality that's dominated by outsourcing, which is all, all these things that were introduced then. And Craig, in the two years that we've had the pandemic, you can see how governments, state governments, federal governments, are still paralysed by that mentality. Mm. It's like there's nobody in there who knows how to take charge the way we had people recruited to take charge in World War II, right? Problem to be solved, get the person in to solve it, make it happen. Instead, it's excuses, excuses, excuses. Well, I think right? Christine Holgate demonstrated what could be done as, as you, when she there was a CEO. There are people that you can recruit to solve problems. Exactly, and that's, that sort of you know take no prisoners attitude of that we can do this. You know, she stood up against the board of Australia Post on the whole bank at post idea because they said, oh, it won't work, we shouldn't go down that idea. She forced it through. She made it happen, and she saved the lives of, of thousands of you know, post office. Well, we have a post, post office network today because of what she did. Yeah. So, you know, you, you can solve the problem, but, but gov government is gripped by this paralysis because they don't believe it's their role. And that's like an alcoholic's first step to solving the problem is admitting they've got a problem. Government's first step to solving problems is a bit, it's their role to solve problems, right? And that's where you've got to destroy the ideology. Robert, let me ask you this. It's a bit of a joke. How do you know there's an election coming? They talk about infrastructure. Exactly. And guess what's happened? Alvin, uh, Albert Albanese has come out talking about a high-speed train between Sydney and Brisbane, well, right? Exactly. Uh, Which we put up in 2003, I think, as a concrete proposal for the... Every Maitland single election federal campaign. election that I can remember, as soon as you're a few months out, every politician starts talking about infrastructure. We've been talking about it for 30 years. Well, Craig, there's a good and bad side of that. So the good side is this, because I don't... You, you, you can be easily cynical about everything in politics, and you shouldn't be. The good side is this. When you see politicians talk about infrastructure, it means they know that's what the Australian people want. And that's why we call this, this, this segment actions, not words, mm. right? We have one, we're winning the argument. Every time an election comes around and they're all competing with each other in infrastructure, we're winning the argument. And the best example of that was the 2020 Queensland state election, because the Liberal, the LNP, One Nation, the Catter Party and the Labor Party all campaigned on their version of the Bradfield Scheme. Whereas 20 years ago, no one was talking about the Bradfield Scheme except Bob Catter and us, right? Now they're all competing for a version of the Bradfield Scheme. Um, the Bradfield Scheme, that's what we want to talk about now. The Bradfield Scheme is like a, an, a, um, an emblematic project for what the future of Australia can be, right? And in the last few years, a lot of people have jumped on the bandwagon. Um, that was an example I've just gave, given you. The other example was Barnaby Joyce. So in 2019, the deputy, uh, he, the man who is now the deputy prime minister, he wasn't then because remember he'd been a naughty boy and lost his job for a while. He was a lowly backbencher, the member for New England. The member for New England what did he do as a backbencher in the 2019 election campaign? He made it all about the Bradfield scheme. So we're going to play a clip here from that time. This is, this is Barnaby on Sky News talking to Peter Credlin. It was just after the Townsville flood and I was up there for Christmas, Craig, and I wish I had a, I wish I had a flood when I was there. I can tell you, it was so hot. But anyway, he's just talking about the t Townsville flood and the, the benefit of going to these places, like, you know, you see the size of these rivers, right? And coming back and I got to see the size of the Clarence River, you know, I, I drove over that bridge too. It's, it's absolutely massive. Massive, massive things. Um, Barnaby, was, Barnaby was talking about the Bradfield scheme on Sky News. And this was just one example. There's a, there's a Facebook video. I wasn't able to find it. I hope he hasn't taken it down. 
Um, there's a Facebook video he put out at the time of him interviewing Sir Leo Helsher and Sir Frank Moore, who were the big Queensland business guys pushing the Bradfield scheme. And in fact, I should say, um, uh, people, viewers of this show should watch our video on the Bradfield scheme. We've got a five minute video you can watch where we explain the whole Bradfield scheme presented by uh, Ben Pierce. And it's a really, really excellent, it's got lo lots of views around Australia. We're getting a lot of support for it. Um, so that'll, that'll explain the whole details, but essentially it's, it's the, the idea of the Great Dividing Range runs down the close to the coast of Australia. And the, co the, the distance between the range and the coast is not that great, but it's enough that when the, the warm waters of the Pacific come in, the, the range pushes them up, they meet cold air, turn into massive rainfalls. So you've got these massive short rivers it, all the way down the coast. And if you could turn some of them over the range, and the Bradfield scheme is the best laid out plan, what Bradfield went through it all, you could keep the inland of Australia and even all the way down to the Murray-Darling Basin recharged with water, mm -hmm. right? You could do a lot of expanded agriculture through irrigation, etc. doing that. It's a, it's a brilliant idea. Imagine the Darling River never running out of water again, right? That, that's, that's, what, that's what's the potential. So anyway, watch Barnaby talk about it in 2019. Regional Australia is very much in the focus, and I know you're now an eminent backbencher. This is still uh, one of your biggest uh, commitments to the parliament, that you won't let regional Australians yep. slip off uh, right. the plate. I want to go first to this issue of the floods in Townsville, but your area, in and around Armidale, New England, Tamworth, you're still in drought. How is it in this country, we've got floods in one area and droughts in the other, and we can't do anything more about getting the water from the place where there's too much to the place where there is not enough? Precisely what I said in an op-ed I wrote the other day, and I could see that it's got you know, a huge viewing, so it obviously resonates. But um, the issue there is we can, if we want to be a nation, want to be a strong nation, want to be a nation with real vision, we can. This is something that was devised by Bradfield um, 90 years ago. At the time, he also devised the Sydney Harbour Bridge and put the uh, design up for that, which at the time, Peter, could have fit every motor car in Australia on it. So it was, many would say, way before its time. That's right. He built it for more, way more lanes than he would ever see in his lifetime. They had tolls for horses going across it. Now, I don't know how it would go taking a mob of cattle or some horses across it now. Imagine you'd get kicked off it. But we could start the process of the Bradfield scheme. It wouldn't cure droughts, but if you want something that deals with the vagaries of the climate and, might, and some might say the sort of more excessive form of climate that we have at the moment, then surely the solution is moving from where we have too much to where we have not enough, from where there's an abundance to where there's a paucity. This is something we could do. What, what would it in involve? People say the tag is sort of 10 billion dollars now the nbn will be nothing short of 80 billion mm -hmm. if you look at the budget this year um, so it, it's not the money that's the real issue is it political will i, I think so there's there's a capricious nature in politics which has uh, only a temporary uh, attachment to an issue and you've got to really hit it when it happens but i think now with the massive floods up north remember from ross uh, river that going over the weir there 2000 cubic meters a second mm -hmm. a second to put that uh, in uh, views, that's 176 gigs. Um, that is uh, really a, a sort of a, a medium-sized dam every day. And that's just one river, and there are many rivers. And you see that massive water up in the Gulf, and I know you have friends around Julia Creek and Richmond, and you know, massive floods there. If that water was to come down, we would have irrigation through western Queensland towns, through western New South Wales. You'd be able to fill up the Menindee Lakes and deal, deal with your problems basically at the lower lakes where they, they were okay, yeah, water. There you go. Now, he's serious, Craig, yep. or he, he seemed to be. And see what he said? Yeah. He said the problem with politics is people just focus on, on it for a short period of time. Yeah. So it's now three years later. Yeah. There's another election yeah. coming on. That man is now the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia. Have you heard him talk about the Bradfield nope. scheme? Nope. I haven't talk, heard him talk about too much at all, actually. Really. Not, not in terms of infrastructure at all. He is the best example of what you just said before. Yeah. Election's coming on. He knows he's got to talk about infrastructure. Well, do you know the difference between if he talks about it now than when he talked about it as a backbencher? He's got the power to bring it about. He can make it happen. Yeah. If he talks about it now and they win, this must happen. He could put out a proposal now for the election to say, we're elected. On this date, this is going to get built. On this date, this is going to get built. That's what that man has the power to do. And what the Australian people have to ask him, are you just teasing us, Barnaby, or are you serious? 
by your own words. It's time to hold these people to account because unless we go to that economic development perspective for Australia, where we expect our government to do things anticipating the future, we build the future again. Unless we do that, get, reorganise our whole economy to be able to do those sort of things, we will never handle these current crises like we're, that we're being smashed by. That's right. And there's plenty to do, Robbie. There's absolutely plenty to do, as we pointed out in this report here. Yeah. So look, we put out a press release this week on this subject, Craig, and um, we'll put the link below. What we're asking everyone to do is, if you support the Bradfield scheme, and I hope you do, make a call to Barnaby's office. He's got two offices, one in Tamworth, one in Tenterfield. And as you said, Tenterfield's right in the middle of where the Clarence River scheme would be, which is another great scheme we won't go into now, um, that, could, that could recharge the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, but he's got his offices there. The, 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 the numbers are on the, on the press release. Call him up. Just a quick call. Hmm. What's Barnaby Joyce doing about the Bradfield scheme? Let's flood him with calls. If he's not going to flood the inland of Australia and the Murray-Darling with water because he's too politically impotent, let's flood him with calls <laughs> to shame him into actually stop being a politician who just talks and use his position to act. That's what's going to save Australia, nothing short of it. Any other comments on that? No, Robbie, I think, you, we're not, <laughs> I think you've made all the points necessary. Let's just get into it. Get, yep. get this Bradfield scheme built. Get let's, the Clarence River scheme built oh, and all yeah. the other ones we've got. Let's, let's go back to building Australia. That's what we've got to do. All right. So, Craig, let's go from that to another disaster that's, that's been a long time in the making. Um, our second story, Ukraine standoff pushes world to brink of another nuclear missile crisis. And like I mentioned earlier, there's two flashpoints in the world right now, actually. Mm. One is Taiwan, which we talked about a lot last year, and Peter Dutton seems to want to single-handedly start World War Three over Taiwan. And the other is Ukraine. And in fact, they're quite similar, right? Where, where countries that, have no, that are nowhere near Russia and China, or Taiwan and Ukraine, are using those two countries to try and put pressure and force the countries that are right beside them, China and Russia, to back down. Um, uh, what the, the concern we have, Craig, with what's just happened in Ukraine, which has suddenly heated up Australians, get one side of the story. Now, we're not going to ju do justice to the whole story in the time we have provided, but what we've done in this week's alert service, and I really urge people to um, get a copy of it, subscribe to it. If you don't subscribe, this is the best um, informative magazine in Australia, but you can, if you haven't got it before, you can get a free copy. We've got an eight-page feature in this week's um, uh, alert service where we cover this in a series of articles. Um, stop World War Three. Anglo-American war hawks push showdown with Russia. Sleepwalking into nuclear World War Three, 1990 to 2021. Um, we'll go through a little bit of that. And Biden is not in lockstep with the war party because there's, there's a sliver of hope, as, as small as it, as it um, may be. But read the details of that. Get the other side of the story. We're going to highlight on the, the main issue, though. And the main issue is, this is what we're being told. The, the main side of the story Australians has been told is Russia amassed 100,000 troops on its border. Its border. Hmm. Not, not the way America amassed 100,000 plus troops on Iraq's border in Saudi Arabia before its two wars or whatever. On the other side of the world, they, Russia, by putting 100,000 troops on its border, total hysteria, Russia's about to invade Ukraine. That's right? what you hear from the Western That's media, what you hear, yeah, right? That's right. Um, the... This has led to uh, very serious talks between the United States and Russia. Now, the, 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 the talks have been at diplomat level and they're laying the foundation for Putin and Biden to actually talk. Um, but the Russians went into those talks, Craig, with a clear demand. Mm. And people, what we want to do today is, um, is explain why that demand is so This important. is not a new demand, Robert. No. This is not something that's just sprung up in the last you know, couple of months. This is something that we've been reporting on since 2012, but it goes back before that into the late 90s, right, the, of this expansion of NATO towards Russia and, more importantly, the deployment of ballistic nuclear weapons, even hypersonic weapons, very close to Russia. So, you know, Russia's concerned that these weapons, if they're deployed, will have a strike time of something like seven to ten minutes yep. or five minutes if they're hypersonic. Yep. And Russia's saying, look, this is a complete violation of everything we agreed going back to Gorbachev's time in the 80s. Well, because what happened was with Gorbachev, um, I'm old enough to remember, the, you know, I was a kid then, but you still remember Glasnost, Perestroika, etc. And, and the consequence of that was the Soviet Union was dismantled. Mm. 
But Ukraine is, and Ukraine got its independence as well, but Ukraine is like a buffer between Russia and the West. And why does, buffer, why does Russia want a buffer? Because historically, it has been the victim of two massive invasions from the West, mm. right? One by Napoleon, one by Hitler. And the Hitler one, 30 million Russians died breaking the back of the Nazis in World War II, right? They were our, our allies then, and that's how many died to break the back of the Nazi war machine. Um, and if it wasn't for the Russians doing that, the Nazis might have won, and the whole world history would have been different. Um, but this is a vulnerability. And so the when um, the Soviet Union broke up, Gorbachev got an undertaking from the West that NATO, which was this entity, this military entity, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, wouldn't expand eastwards, yeah. right? And instead what happened? Well, look at the graphic. It expanded relentlessly. And what they're now on Ukraine's doorstep. They're, they've got the, the West, the British and Americans, you know, tee up Ukrainian politicians to request NATO membership. And Russia said, no, that's a red line. Ukraine cannot become a member of NATO, right? Because you are destroying um, our security by doing this. And the, th the problem is, Craig, the way this is reported in the West, people don't take this demand seriously enough. It's like, oh, who cares what Russia's demand is? Well, Sometimes the shoe's been on the other foot. I'll get to that in a minute, though. But I wanted to just just give just, one. Ex sorry, just, just, just make this comparison. What if Russia was to put a hundred thousand troops on the Canadian border? Yeah. Do you think the United States would be very happy about that? Well, yeah. So, okay. No, let's follow that through. Canada um, is a land mass, and there's there's Alaska, etc. But Canada may decide, oh, we want to be an ally of Russia, right? They're, they're quite close to each other up the north there. Um, you know, Alaska's in the way, and then and then but Canada's right there. So what if Canada did that? What would America do? Yeah. Right? Hell no. No. You're not going to do that. So you have the situation where America is building up forces on the Ukrainian border. Yep. Right, potentially. With these potential weapons. With these potential weapons. So it's the same as 100,000 troops on the Canadian border looking at, looking at the United States. They're not very happy about it. All they right, wouldn't now, be very happy about it. So what I, I want to play a clip that just proves that, you know, it's not just Putin saying this and there's two Aussies in Australia who agree with him and no. the rest of the world doesn't, right? It's not true. Um, we had the pleasure, uh, Craig, you and I, of getting to know Malcolm Fraser in his final years, right? Uh, and it was over this issue, remember? Yeah. Um, Malcolm Fraser was... So he's a former Australian Prime Minister who was a Prime Minister during the Cold War. He had a very good strategic sense of the world and at the end of his of his life, his main concern was the potential for World War III with Russia and China. And he wrote a book called Dangerous Allies. And those, that's what he called the United States and the United Kingdom, our dangerous allies. He said, they're the ones that are the factor for war in the world today, right? Anyway, so in 2014, when the Americans backed actual neo-Nazis, actual neo-Nazis, the, 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 the children and grandchildren and the, and the intellectual descendants of the Banderites in Ukraine who had allied with Hitler and slaughtered lots of Jews, etc., in World War II, they backed those people to run a violent coup in Ukraine. That's what happened in 2014. Malcolm Fraser was one of, he was very prominent, but there was not, he wasn't the only one. He was one of a number of senior statesmen around the world. It was interesting they were senior statesmen, right? Not, not the current generation of politicians, people of much, much more experience and much wiser, who said, this is wrong. And he went on Russia Today in 2014. We're going to play a little bit of a clip of that interview. Now, he went on Russia Today deliberately. Russia Today is, of course, funded by the Russian government. It's their version of ABC, right? Mm -hmm. And he got criticised for that, but he didn't care. He was making an intervention. He went on Russia Today so that his voice would be heard around the world, where he just said, well, he said this. Now, we are hearing a lot these days about the prospect of another Cold War, and you actually lived through the original Cold War. Do you think a rerun is possible? A new Cold War is certainly possible, and uh, it's easy to cast blame for the situation that has arisen. Uh, I think NATO missed a great opportunity when the, with the breakup of the Soviet Union. I know President Gorbachev believed he had an agreement uh, with the first Bush administration that NATO would not move east. 
NATO had after all done its job, but then it pushed ahead to the borders of Russia. And I can understand Russians believing that that's a provocative move. Mm -hmm. There would have been other ways, less provocative ways, of ensuring the security and independence mm -hmm. of Eastern European states. And uh, I think the West then lost an opportunity to really begin to make Russia a collaborative partner. Mm -hmm. Mr. Fraser, you just mentioned that the, those uh, inroads into Russia's uh, immediate neighborhood by NATO are seen in, in Moscow as provocative, but when Russia expresses those concerns, they are usually taken as paranoid in the West. And even if we accept them as such, as paranoid, what's the point from the Western perspective of pushing a paranoid Russia to its limit? Well, I don't believe Russia is paranoid. I, I do believe Russia has historic interests. And this was certainly a, a traditional area of Russian interest, long, long preceding communism and Stalin. Um, and the United States in particular said, no, this is going to become an area of Western influence, of NATO influence, European influence, or American influence. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can understand um, Russia being greatly disturbed mm -hmm. about this. So there you go. Malcolm Fraser wanted the world, Craig, to see Russia's pers perspective. That's what was important to him. Could, yeah. Because he saw the actual danger of nuclear war. And we've become very, very close. To, well, we are very, very close to this in this current period. Now, the, other, the comparison that you talked about, the hypothetical one with Canada, mm. there is actually a real one. Mm. And that's, the other, that's, that's a dimension of this people need to look at, which is the Cuban Missile Crisis. Because what was the Cuban Missile Crisis? That was when the Soviets installed missiles on America's doorstep. And what, how did America react? No way, no how. There were 13 days the world was on the brink. The closest the world's ever been to nuclear war was in those 13 days when the Americans stared down the Russians, the Soviets, and said, get those missiles out of there, right? JFK did that. Mm. And he had to stare down his own generals who wanted to start world war, nuclear war, right, over it. Um, but, but he forced the Russians to back off. That's the equivalent. People got to understand that's the equivalent. Um, let's end this on a good note, though, Craig, because this week the permanent five members of the UN Security Council put out a statement reiterating that nuclear war is unthinkable. The permanent five are the United States, Russia, China, um, France, and the United Kingdom. They're the permanent five members, mm -hmm. right? They put out a statement, nuclear war is unthinkable. And that is so important to see at this time. However, this confrontation we're dealing with is driven by people in the what we call the war party in the United Kingdom and the United States, who actually are prepared to start a nuclear war. And that's where the danger lies. Yeah, because they talk about this idea of a limited nuclear war, which is absurd, because once a nuclear war breaks out, it's never going to be limited, and the effects are never going to be limited. So the, this is an insane. There's nothing else you can say about it, Robbie, that, that, than it is insane. And that's why, look, people should call up the 1-800 number, it's on the screen now, or email us, and get a copy of these reports, right? We'll send them out to anyone. Yep. It doesn't matter if you've already got stuff from us before. We'll send it out to you anyway. This is so important that people start to get the non-Westernised media view of what's actually taking place in this region. We're doing it for the sake of world peace, and we want to make, make sure we don't end up into World War Three. So people should get a copy of these reports and understand what's going on here. We've written, you know... New citizens about this in the past. There's at least three that I can recall where these issues were put on the table and actually explored. You know, we go through the detail in one new citizen in great detail the whole you know, takeover of Ukraine by these neo Nazi factions, which most people have no idea about. And I mean, a lot of politicians, a lot of our leaders have no idea about this too, unfortunately. And unless we as Australians see the other side's perspective, you don't even have to agree with it, but you've got to know what it is, right? Because, and if you do know what it is, you may find yourself agreeing with it. Yeah, that's and the right. fact that Malcolm Fraser agreed with it should tell you something. And, and right? look, we, we talk about the same issues relating to China. And of course, the push it's, the, it's push precisely for war. the same th challenge. Yeah, push for war in the South Sea, you know, South Sea, um, South, South, South China, China Sea uh, issues and so forth. I mean, it's the same issues, the same war party. Yep. Bobby. Yep. And if you don't want war and you want the kind of economic development instead that we have gone through in the first segment of this show, 
get involved in the CEC and sorry, <laughs> the Citizens Party. <laughs> well, that uh, just refers back to our, a long yeah, history yeah. on this, Robbie. Old habits die hard. Get involved in the Citizens Party and our fight to stop it, right? Because economic development is a much, much better way um, and a future for humanity. All right, so Craig, um, thanks for joining us for the first episode of the Citizens Report for yeah, 2022. Thanks, Robbie. It's been good. Um, thanks to the, the viewer for tuning in. Click on the links below, etc. Call Barnaby Joyce um, and tune in next week for more of the Citizens Report. Authorised by Robert Bowick, Citizens Party, Melbourne.